Nation. How refugee studies turn burden into benefit. Alexander Betts, University of Oxford. When the Berlin Wall came down, I was nine years old and watching on television with my mother in Bristol. In 2015, more than a million asylum seekers came to Europe in what became known as the European Refugee Crisis. In reality, though, it wasn't so much a crisis of numbers, but a crisis of politics. A million people in a Europe of 28 countries and over 200 million people should have been manageable. They were fleeing persecution and conflict, and we could have coped with international cooperation. But what I want to argue is that the idea of a crisis to do with refugees, whether globally or in Europe, stems from one simple but misguided assumption, held often by the media, the public, and policymakers. And that assumption is the idea that refugees have to be an inevitable burden. I want to challenge that with evidence and suggest that, in fact, they can be contributors. They can be a benefit to their host societies if we create a policy framework that allows that. This photograph looks as though it could have been 2015 or 2016, but actually it was 18 years ago. And these are not Syrian refugees crossing the Balkans, but Kosovar refugees, 800,000 of whom came to Europe in 1999. At the time, I was a student, and like many students, I had a long summer holiday with a lot of free time, not much money, so I volunteered to spend some time in a reception center for refugees in the Netherlands. And while there, I wasn't doing very much other than supporting games and activities for the children. What I expected to find was a sense of pity, but what I actually found was a source of inspiration. I met people with skills, talents, and aspirations. I met, for instance, a Bosniak lawyer who taught me the basis of public international law. I met an Iranian former Olympian who taught me table tennis. I was inspired. And yet those people were trapped in a bureaucratic system unable to work, often for many years. And what I found as I traveled around the world was that that situation replicated. People with the ability to contribute were denied that opportunity. This photograph shows the Ali Ade refugee camp on the border between Djibouti and Somalia. It's home to about 10,000 Somalis and Ethiopians. While I was there, I met one Somali lander called Wuli, He's been there since 1988, and he's still there today. He arrived at age 18, and he told me, man doesn't live on food and water alone, but on hope. My hope is gone, and I pass it on to the next generation. And in his tent, he teaches informal mathematics and English language to that next generation. But Wooly should also have hope. Today, there are more displaced people around the world than at any time since the Second World War, some 65 million, about a third of whom are refugees, having fled across an international border. That number should be manageable. The number of refugees is about 0.3% of the world's population. But the challenge is one of geographical concentration. Nearly 90% of the world's refugees are in developing regions. They're not in Europe, they're not in North America, they're in countries like Uganda, Tanzania, Kenya, Ethiopia, Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan. Just 10 host countries host 60% of the world's refugees, and 55% of the world's refugees are from just three fragile states, Syria, South Sudan, and Afghanistan. We need to share that responsibility far better. But more importantly, we need to give refugees greater choice. Today, if you're a Syrian family fleeing Syria, we basically offer as a system three choices, all inadequate. Encampment. In camps around the world, refugees may get assistance, but they're invariably denied the right to work, and they can get trapped in the system. People in camps stay for, on average, up to two decades, sometimes more. Secondly, we often offer the choice to move informally to urban areas, but only the very poorest get assistance, and often refugees can't work. They're stuck in that double bind. And the third choice they have is to embark on dangerous journeys, often with smugglers. And that's what we saw in Europe. <laughs> 
We have to expand beyond that impossible choice. There has to be more provided to refugees than the current humanitarian system offers. So together with my research team in Oxford, in 2012, we embarked on a new area of work to look at the economics of refugees' contributions to their host societies and the impact they have. And we started that work in a fairly unique country, Uganda. We chose Uganda not because it's representative. It's not. It's a very different kind of host country, but because it's unique. It's adopted what it calls a self-reliant strategy. Unlike its neighbors, it allows refugees to work. It gives them freedom of movement. This settlement, the Nakivali settlement, has three big, thriving markets. And we wanted to see what that does for refugees and what it does for citizens of the host country. And in the data that we collected, we challenged five myths about the economic lives of refugees. We challenged the idea that their economic lives are isolated. This photograph shows a Congolese ceremonial fabric called Betenge. When we asked NGOs where it comes from, they said, it probably comes across the border from the Democratic Republic of Congo. But when we pushed a little bit further and asked refugees, they said, we import it through our own supply chains from as far afield as India and China. Of course we're part of the global economy. What do you think we're doing with our time? Secondly, we were able to challenge the idea of refugees an inevitable burden. We found that some 21% of refugees in the capital of Uganda, Kampala, run a business that employs at least one other person. And of those they employ, 40% are host nationals. Refugees were making jobs when given the chance to set up businesses. Thirdly, we challenged the idea that refugees are economically homogenous. We found over 200 distinctive livelihoods activities in Uganda. And even though the average income was relatively low, there was significant variation. We challenged the idea that refugees don't use technology. They do. SMS technology, even the absence of broadband, was used as part of core livelihoods activities, sharing and pesa and business information and staying in touch with contacts. We challenge the notion that refugees are inevitably dependent. They really don't have to be. In our survey, less than 1% of refugee households had no form of independent income generating activity. You can't live on World Food Programme rations alone, and so most refugees simply don't. Since then, we've broadened our study. We're collecting what economists call panel data, cross-country data, and data over time, following refugees and host communities. This year, we've collected data in Kenya, a country that contrasts dramatically in its policies from Kenya, from Uganda. It doesn't allow refugees to work. It doesn't allow them freedom of movement. But what we found, looking in the area around this camp, Kakuma, was that even without the formal right to work, refugees engage in economic activities. They support themselves and make a contribution. To parallel the Uganda work, we've challenged five different kinds of myths through this work. Firstly, we challenged the idea of a single legal framework. Even without the formal right to work, there's huge variation in the tolerance of economic activity. In the Dadaab camps, it's fairly intolerate, untolerated. But as you move to Kakuma, local politicians accept that the local economy depends upon refugees. No right to work does not mean unemployment. In Kakuma, 38% of refugees are employed in the formal sector, albeit mainly by NGOs and international organizations. And that compares favorably to the surrounding host population, amongst whom 48% are employed. One of the most stark findings in Kenya, though, is that refugees are not dependent for social protection on the top-down international community. They're supporting themselves through their families, their communities, their networks. We asked refugees what they would do if they faced a particular kind of emergency. For instance, if they needed to go to the police, go for a job, were lacking food, or faced an emergency. And at the top of the list was the idea that they would go to community leaders, family inside the camp, or a neighbor, long before they would resort to international assistance. So refugees have informal social protection structures that they rely on. We were able to challenge the idea that the main barrier to economic activity, including starting businesses, was actually the regulatory framework. It wasn't. It was market-based factors. Refugees cited factors like demand, supply, competition. It was those that were much more important 
than the idea that the government was stopping them from working. We challenged the idea as well that refugees are necessarily worse off than the host population. This data shows years of education comparing three refugee populations, the Congolese, the Somalis, and the South Sudanese, with the surrounding host Takana population. And what's striking is that Takana have the least years of education. This highlights for me something that's crucial when we think about refugee policy. A good refugee policy also has to be a good host community policy. The host community must share in the benefits and not be left behind. When we came to crunch the numbers and look at the regression, we found a wide variety of insights into what explains when refugees thrive rather than merely survive. And as you'd expect, the variables that matter are things like education, occupation, years in exile, gender, and regulation. That data is very useful for practice because it tells us how we can create enabling environments that allow refugees to flourish rather than struggle. The things that they need are the things that we would all need to survive economically. Access to work and the right to work, infrastructure, including roads, water, energy, access to capital, connectivity and broadband, which are lacking in many refugee hosting areas, and crucially, education. We found the returns to education increase as you go through the system from primary to tertiary. But other areas are more challenging than, say, the Uganda example. One example is Jordan, officially home to about 600,000 Syrian refugees, despite having a population of only around 8 million. In 2015, I traveled to Jordan with my colleague, the development economist Paul Collier. And we were there to brainstorm ways in which the country could respond more sustainably to refugees. And while visiting the Zatari refugee camp, home to 83,000 Syrians, we were taken on a bit of a detour. And we found 15 minutes away was a special economic zone. The government had invested about 100 million in that economic zone, connecting it to the electricity grid and the road network. And while 15 minutes away, there were 83,000 refugees not allowed to work, that economic zone had a crucial shortage of labor and workers. So being Oxford academics, we stood back and we put two and two together and probably made five. And we said, well, hang on. Given that you have all of these refugees wanting to work and you need workers, why not allow them to work in your economic zones? And that idea, which we pitched to the Jordanian government and the donor community, took off in London in February 2016 with the launch of the Jordan Compact. The World Bank put funding in. The European Union provided trade concessions to the economic zones when factories employed refugees. And today, there are factories operating employing Syrians alongside Jordanians. For instance, when I visited a couple of months ago, I saw the Al Faya company producing plastics. It previously worked near Damascus and is now operating in one of those economic zones. Of its 313 staff, around 82 are Syrians. It's exporting to Europe under the compact, where 40% of its sales go. It's got a mixed record, but I think from a country that previously de facto denied refugees the right to work, to one that today has provided over 60,000 work permits to Syrian refugees, there's massive progress. It's mainly providing jobs to men. More needs to be done to support gender parity. There's a lack of investment from companies, with a few exceptions, like IKEA and Walmart. But it's an experiment that shows that if we can make the case to business, we can transform economic opportunity and create autonomy for refugees. This week, and in fact today, we're launching a new study that's come out, which we've jointly authored with Deloitte, looking at the economic lives of Syrians in Europe, comparing the UK, the Netherlands, and Austria. And what it shows is a real opportunity, but also a paradox. We found that 82% of Syrian refugees in our survey are unemployed, and yet 38% have university degrees. So we have the talent here, but we need business to embrace that. The main barriers that we found in the study are language, institutional disincentives, and skills. We need the voices of refugees to be part of our economies. And that's why I'm delighted that after this session, four former refugee students will be present next to the sunflower, I gather, so you can engage in conversation with them. So what does this mean for rethinking the system? 
A functioning refugee system at the global level and at the national level must do three things. It must provide a duty of rescue. It must provide safe haven to those in need, food, clothing, shelter. <coughs> but that by itself is not enough. We must also offer autonomy, jobs, education, socioeconomic freedom, the things that ensure, ensure human flourishing. And that includes doing so in the regions where most of the refugees are. And that's where the system has been lacking. The third thing, though, is we need a route out of limbo. It may be acceptable to allow people to stay for five years, even seven, but beyond that is far too much. So what next? What can you do to help the system? How can we all support refugees? <laughs> as my artists, as members of the host community, we all have an obligation. Do you feel that obligation? I think you should speak up and announce that you do. <laughs> In the future, In the future, there will be more displaced by climate change and fragile states, and we all have a choice. We can recognize them as a benefit to our societies or treat them as a burden that stands on stage and unnecessarily offers water. Thank you very much.